dearest Texas history scholars, today we're looking at Unit 7, Notes. The first thing that we're going to do is look at our timeline. Sam Houston resigns as the governor of Texas because he refuses to swear an oath of allegiance to the Confederate States of America. The next thing is that the Civil War lasted from 1861 to 1865. And we're going to jump down here, 1870, we have President Grant, whoops, sorry, President Grant is going to sign an act to readmit Texas into the congressional rep representation. This is sort of like a re-annexation after the Civil War. This right here is the era of Reconstruction. And that lasts from 1845 after the Civil War all the way to 1874. Next, we're going to look at the reasons for Texas involvement in the Civil War. And the first one is states' rights. The states believed that they should be able to make all the decisions that concerned their state with minimal federal government interference. They also held that slavery was vital to the economy of the South. There's also something called sectionalism And that's when you are loyal to the interests of your own region and not the country as a whole. Many Texans came from southern states and they, they grew cotton as the other states in the south did. Number four is that Texas resembled the political values, economy, and social structure of the South. They were based on plantation agriculture. Oh, yes, on plantation agriculture, slave labor, and the Democratic Party. This indicates an ideology which is a really big word, but we're going to look at, at that later on in the week, or maybe next week. Number five is a tariff. So the South was creating 80% of the world's cotton, and then the federal government was taxing that because they felt like it was unethical for the South to have slaves. That's pretty complicated, but again, we'll talk more about this later on in our unit. The next thing is the nullification crisis of 1832, and pretty much what happened was that President Jackson created a law, and it was called the Tariff of abomination and the government was saying that if they were using if anybody was using slave labor whoops you can't see that if they're using slave labor that they'll have to pay extra taxes and so then the south had to sell they had to change the price of their cotton to keep up and south carolina said that this was unconstitutional So this law was about 30 years before the Civil War. It was peacefully settled, but this is the point where we know that the Civil War is coming. The nullification crisis is like, hey, things are not going well, and it's going to end in war. Warning, warning. But then the United States is like, meh, whatever. Let's just not deal with it until the Civil War. So this is like during the Civil War, this is what happens politically, economically, and socially. In order to understand what political effect means, we're gonna draw this picture right here. That's a little government. Here's what was happening in the government. 
Texas joins the Conf Ooh, I spelled that wrong. Confederate States. And then Houston is removed from office when he refuses to swear the oath to the Confederacy. There is a conscription act. And the conscription act forces 60,000 Texans to join the Confederate army. Economically speaking, that means money. There is a shortage of commodities. So a commodity is something that you need. It's sort of like a supply. Coffee, medicine, clothing, salt, pepper, just food in general. There's a, a shortage of that. So Texas trades along the Mexican border for goods, and then Texans distribute those goods among the southern states. There's also cotton production that decline, that declines and a shortage of free labor. There is inadequate production in agriculture and then also in business. This negatively affects everyone in the state. Social effect, that's where we draw people. Whoa, that's not a good person. Uh-oh. Okay, well, whatever. That person has their legs crossed. <laughs> okay, so a social effect is that there's a greater responsibility for women and children during the war. And then there's also huge losses of family members. And that's like for everyone. Everyone loses uh, either a son or some kind of parent or something like that. It's very sad. Um, okay, so now we're looking at Reconstruction, which happens after the Civil War. This is like the rebuilding of society and government after the Civil War. So first we're going to look at the political effect. That means government. There is a martial law, which is a military policy that starts during Governor Edwards. And it just means that if the government tells you to do something, you have to do it now. You can't delay, you have to do it. Um, next page. We have the Constitution of 1876. We still use this Constitution today in the state of Texas. There are some... Indian Wars trying to push Native Americans onto reservations during this time. And then we have the passage of the Reconstruction Amendments. 13th ends slavery. The 14th Amendment grants citizenship. And then the 15th Am Amendment grants suffrage, which means the right to vote. And so if Kelly Bradshaw, my old coworker, were here, she would make you stand up and chant 13, 14, 15, free men vote. Because this is something that you're going to have to know later on when you take your test for the um, star test. Free men vote. 13th makes them free. 14th give citizenship to males only because women didn't have the right to vote. Even Anglo-American women didn't. And then 15th is the right to vote, so free men vote. Here's some economic growth. That means money. There's growth of tenant farming, which is where you borrow supplies and you borrow land. Nothing you grow is actually yours. It's very unfair, and that is a similar system to sharecropping. There is expansion of railroads. And then there's also a boom in the cattle industry. The social effect is going to look at people. 
try to make that one without his legs being crossed. Good job, Mrs. Edwards. We have a concern over future freedmen. So it's great that the slaves are free, but now you have a lot of new citizens that don't have jobs and don't own land. And so how do you recover from that? How do you like incorporate those people in society when they don't necessarily have job skills outside of agriculture? So how do we, how are we going to create jobs for freedmen? Juneteenth is a holiday. It's, it was on June 19th. 1865 and this celebrates freed enslaved people and it becomes a state holiday because it's emancipation day in texas that means that it's set it was the day that people became free in texas there's a freedmen's bureau that tries to address this issue the future of former slaves teaching job skills where are they going to go to school? Is it going to be segregated or not? And then the black codes are used to specifically segregate public spaces. There is a lot of immigration to Texas during this time. Immigration increased in Texas. Oh, here's an answer for your quiz, Juneteenth. All right, major characters in Unit 7, John Bell Hood is the leader of the Confederacy's Hood's Texas Brigade. And then he's most notable for the Seven Day Battle, Seven Days Campaign, and he fought at the Battle of Gettysburg. Fort Hood in Killeen, Texas is named after John Bell Hood. John Reagan served in the cabinet of the Confederate President Jefferson Davis. Francis Lubbock served as the governor after they fired um, Sam Houston. After Sam Houston resigned slash got fired, then they hire Francis Lubbock to be the governor of Texas. Thomas Green led the troops that were on the steamboats converted to gunboats by John B. Magruder. And then John B. Magruder was a commander of Confederate forces in Texas. And then he was known to have converted Union ships in Galveston, or known to attack Union ships in Galveston and he took back control of Galveston. John B. Magruder is who we kind of talked about in the last bullet but this is a commander of Confederate forces in Texas. The Civil War battles that we're going to look at is all part of the Anaconda plan where the northern states try to suffocate the southern states. They try to cut off supplies so that if the south doesn't have what they need then they can't fight any longer. It's sort of like a snake which is why it's named the Anaconda plan. The Battle of Galveston happened in July of 1861. The Confederate, no the Union forces tried to grab a hold of the of Galveston because they knew it was a trading port until John B. Magruder recaptured the city and he used these boats that he called cotton clads because he had lined them with cotton bales. Pretty smart. July 1st, 1863, we have General Magruder and his men attack Union forces and then they recapture Galveston. The next battle is the Battle of Sabine Pass. Union General Franklin 
and troops try to attack Sabine City. They march overland to try to get to Houston and Beaumont. And then there's a Fort Griffin. That's the name of the camp near Sabine Pass. It's not the one that's in Albany. So the, uh, this fort was guarded by the Davis Guards. And then the Union soldiers tried to attack, but the Davis Guards fought back. And this marks a complete victory for the Confederacy. The Battle of Palmetto Ranch is the last battle in all of the United States of the Civil War. It happens after General Lee had already surrendered. He surrendered on April 9th, 1865, but Confederate forces did not stop fighting for another month because word spread slowly. So May 12th, 1865, the Un Union Army moved inland to occupy Brownsville. They collide with Confederate troops led by John Ford. He captured a bunch of Union troops, but then the Union troops were like, hey man, the war's over, give it up. So they were on their way. The Confederacy was going to win this battle, but then the Union troops are like, hey man, the war really is over. So that ends the battle and no one actually wins. So there's your notes. I hope that you have a wonderful day.